Manti Teo is a top few college football player ever. Not just player on the field statistically, leader, example. I think you changed the game of college football. Like you were like a transcendent college football player. Dude, you couldn't turn on ESPN and not see something about Manti Teo every day. You were at the pinnacle. Yeah. The very top. Yeah. And your whole life changed. One of college football's biggest names is caught in the middle of a bizarre hoax. Notre Dame superstar linebacker. The star player. Manti Teo. Manti Teo. Manti Teo. Manti Teo. Had an absolutely astounding senior year. Whose heartbreaking loss of his girlfriend just before a big game made national headlines and made Manti Teo the individual story of the college football season. But now it turns out his relationship was an elaborate hoax. This was a very sophisticated hoax, perpetrated for reasons we can't fully understand. Now Netflix dropping a documentary on Manti Teo's infamous online relationship. The fact that the Netflix special didn't quite capture it, and it's important to go to the source, mm -hmm. which is you. What was missed in that Netflix special? One thing that not only the documentary hit on it, but one thing that every news outlet missed my grandmother passed away and it kind of took over the narrative i had lost two people in the same day my grandmother first and then a few hours later finding out that my girlfriend or who i believe to be my girlfriend passed the unfortunate reality of that time was i mourned two deaths Regardless if we found out months later that one of them wasn't real, I mourned both of them as if they did. I went through those emotions. I went through that process of mourning it and processing all of those feelings. Anti tail, welcome to the roller coaster. Thank you, bro. I don't really go on roller coasters, bro, so I'm excited for this one. This be your first one. Yeah, yeah. My It'll wife be, is the roller coaster one. It'll be good. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you're doing you're doing some dieting right now and you know, you're telling me that you're not doing as many carbs anymore and I was I was feeling the same way. You were looking a little small. So, um, you doing okay, feeling a little smaller? Yeah. You know, I think uh I'm definitely I'm, I'm it's been a, a little bit of a challenge for sure. But I have a great perspective um, in my house because my wife is on her show prep yep. and she has her show in two days. And so you could imagine like she's on zero carbs. Yeah. And so whenever you're getting a few. Yeah. Like at least I'm getting two meals where I have some carbs, you know, and it's 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 the carbs that I like. So you, know, you got to you got to have that perspective. You know, It could be worse. For those who are listening and not watching, you don't understand the joke. But the joke is, <laughs> Manti's huge. He's massive, and he's as lean as he's been in ten years. And yeah. you're looking amazing. Thank you, brother. Honestly, Thank like I, I know what you've done to get to where you're at. Yeah. It's a huge sacrifice. We'll talk a little bit about that. But dude, you look like insane. Thank you, brother. Thank so, you. It's for nice my show. kids. It's for my kids. I want to talk about this hat. You were recently on the Pat McAfee show. He yeah. commented on this, you know, I know it's not Teo, but it, yeah. it feels and looks like it. Yeah. Are, did you guys end up doing a run of those? So what we're doing is, and, and I said on the Pat McAfee show, um, the the ending part of this is actually a logo for the company, Jen. Yeah. Um, and they do sales. And, you know, they were the first company that I actually did um, a public speaking event for. And I'm grateful for them because they kind of, I always say like, you know, they were the start, you know? Yeah. Um, but their marketing guy is genius. His name is Donnie. Um, unfortunately, he's a USC guy. Um, but he had this bright idea to make, to combine their logo with my first, the first two letters of my last name. And Sick. it kind of looks like Teo or yeah. Team Teo, right? Yeah. And so uh, he gave me a bunch of, um, and so I've been wearing them around and every time I, you know, people see me, they're like, bro, let me get one of those hats. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and it wasn't until Pat, you know, was like, bro, send some hats over. I was like, you know, what? I called Donnie up. I was like, Donnie, you know, I was just on a Pat McAfee show. Everybody asked me all the time about the hat. I was like, it's time we do something. However, I can't sell something with somebody else's logo on it, you know? So 
he's he's in the process right now using his expertise of how to tweak it just a little bit so that it could be my own thing and i you know i don't probably get sued i know i know i know the boys over there at gen probably wouldn't do it but you know i just want to be respectful of, of their stuff you know yeah. so yeah we'll see we'll yeah see. if if pat says do a thing you just yeah, do yeah, a thing right yeah yeah <laughs> that was that was sick that you went on that you went on his show that's got to be a that's got to be a dream because he's he's number one far and away right now in sports yeah. media and you, you did a really good job on there i want to start off just kind of before we get into your story, and I know there's going to be a lot of people listening who already know your story and some and some who don't, mm-hmm. which will be fun to, to talk through this. But I want to start off with maybe a, a question to set the stage, mm-hmm. okay? Knowing what you know now, mm-hmm. at this prime age, mm-hmm. what would you tell your younger self? Um, I'll tell my younger self a few things. One, be an oak. And what I mean by that is, as you go through life, there's going to be a lot of different people pushing you, a lot of different pressures pushing pushing on you, a lot of different aspirations that I may have. um, But to be immovable in who you are, um, to never forget your roots, to never forget what makes you, you. And um, I would want my younger self to know that because there was a period in time where I was trying to be like the crowd, that I was trying to fit in. And it took everything that was special in me and just literally threw it out the window. And I would want my younger self to know that you were created to do something special, but in order to do that special thing, you have to be an oak. You can't be swayed in any direction. You have to be firm in your beliefs, be firm in, in, in the vision that you have for yourself. Um, and I would want that for not only my younger self, but all the younger people out there. Um, with all the pressures of life and you, you see all of these, these little TikTok things, you know, you know, all of these fads that people are getting in and, um, these trending topics don't, don't follow those, you know, follow the path that God set for you and promise you, like, if you're on his path, everything's going to work out for the better and everything's going to work out for the good. So that's one of the things that I'll tell my younger self. Really well said. And I totally agree with that. I think that's amazing. Thank you to our sponsors over at Bucked Up. I love this company. I love their products, their apparel, and their supplements. Recently, they dropped the mother of all pre-workouts, Mother Bucker. This is not for the faint of heart. This will make you want to claw your face off. So don't get stuck in traffic when you're headed to the gym. I love these guys. I love this company, and I love their products. They are clearly the best tasting pre-workout on the entire market, and they're number one for a reason. 
Bucked Up is my favorite workout brand, hands down. And they also have my favorite apparel for working out and just for daily life. It's Lululemon-like quality, but for a fraction of the price that's affordable. So head over to their site, buckedup.com, where you can check it out. And for 20% off their entire site, use the code TylerHall20. I want to talk about an experience you had post college. Mm-hmm. Before we do that, I was going to go directly into that, but I think I think it's appropriate to set the stage for who you were in college. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I remember I think anybody who is a fan of sports, <laughs> specifically football, mm-hmm. would say that Manti Teo is a top few college football player ever. Mm-hmm. Not just player on the field statistically, leader um, example. Um, I think you change the game of college football. I think you change the way that linebackers play defense. Like you were like a transcendent college football player. Thanks bro. Like it was like, dude, you couldn't turn on ESPN and not see something about Manti Teo every day. Mm -hmm. You were at the pinnacle. Yeah. The very top. Yeah. Every award mm-hmm. that you can get as a linebacker, except the Heisman, but yeah. you were runner up, right? Like yeah. basically every award that yeah. you could possibly get, you got. Yeah. So I want the audience to know that who doesn't know you, the few people. Mm-hmm. Like you you reached the peak yeah. all the way at the top. It was a summit. Like yeah. <laughs> you were like in the clouds. Like yeah. I, I think you got to the summit and then yeah. somehow you yeah. like had a booster yeah. pack, you know, you yeah. went further. Yeah. Insane. And, and your whole life changed mm-hmm. eventually. There's one thing that, you know, you and I, as we've gotten to know each other better, we, we actually do have a lot in common. But there's one thing that I haven't shared with you that we have in common, which is that both of us believed for a period of time that we had lost the love of our life. Mm-hmm. You believed that somebody who you were dating Mm-hmm. died mm-hmm. I believe that my wife died mm-hmm. for a period of a few hours until I got to the hospital and realized she was alive mm-hmm. still and so I have empathy for you and, and what you went through mm-hmm. with that I know exactly what it feels like to think that you've lost somebody who you're really close to mm-hmm. I've heard you share before you know I kind of want to start um, talking about everything that happened by asking I've heard you talk about the fact that the Netflix special didn't quite capture it. And it's important to go to the source, Mm -hmm. which is you. Yeah. What was missed in that Netflix special? What key moments or experiences were missed? Well, I think first, not a lot of things were missed. Um, And I understand that within the time frame that we had, it was hard to get it all, right? Um, one thing that not only the documentary, well, the documentary hit on it um, in, 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 in the way that it did, but one thing that every news outlet missed, right? Because this, this, this girlfriend became, you know, people later on figure, realized that, we all realized that it was a catfishing incident Um, and it kind of took over the narrative. Um, What the, the, the very one of the most important pieces was that my grandmother passed away. And that was something that almost, it always rubbed me a little wrong because it's almost like people just skimmed over that. Like it was like, Oh, he lost a girlfriend. He lost a girlfriend. Oh, she wasn't real. She was fake. How could he do that? Well, it. I think what made it a big story was I had lost two people in the same day. My grandmother first, and then a few hours later, finding out that, you know, my girlfriend who I, who, who or who I believe to be my girlfriend passed a few, few hours later. So it became a bigger story because two people in my life passed. 
and I'm grateful that you shared what you shared because the 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 unfortunate reality of that time was I mourned two deaths. Regardless if we found out months later that one of them wasn't real, I mourned both of them as if they did. 100%. You know, so I went through those emotions. I went through the, that process of of mourning it and and you know, processing all of those feelings um, to 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 mourn my grandmother and to mourn who I believe to be my girlfriend, right? So that was that is one detail. Those are two details. One, my grandmother passed, and two, that I, that regardless if in January we all found out that it was a catfishing thing, in September or August when it when it happened, September September when it happened, when I forgot, found out the news, I mourned them, both, and so I went through those those pro that process for for two people. So that was one thing that um, that's just one thing you know for me that. That, that that I've accepted, that I had to go through that, I went through that, and regardless if it was something that we found out months later that wasn't, that it actually was a catfishing thing, I didn't know it, obviously, so I mourned it, you know? So um, if anything, that allowed me to go deeper into um, a world that I'm now able to empathize with people, like how you're able to empathize with me because you've, you've experienced those emotions, just because we all found out that it was a catfishing thing, I can em I can empathize with somebody because I didn't know it was catfishing, but I experienced those emotions as if I lost two loved ones. So I, anybody that has lost a, lost a loved one, I can empathize with you, and I think that what that's what makes me stronger. Um, that's what makes me more capable, and I'm grateful that I am given those um, gifts to be available to other people in that way. Is there a chance that she could have died, your girlfriend, mm -hmm. and nobody ever find out that it was a catfishing thing and your life just go on and you still believe to this day? Is there a chance that that could have happened or was it for sure going to unravel at some point? Um, you know, what was so... What, what was so... Uh, it was so difficult at that time was where my career was and where it was going. So after I got the news, right, I immediately had a perspective change about what was important and what was not important in my life. And it was so beautiful because when I made that perspective change, my play on the field just took off. You know, it was like, I don't care about... I don't care about the parties. I don't care about the the after the game festivities. Yeah. The only thing that I care about is honoring my family, honoring my loved ones, the ones that are here and the ones that have passed. I'm trying to be um, an inspiration to people, trying to be somebody that people can look to who have gone through some trying times and say, like, look at how he's handling these situations, right? And and being that that pillar in their life or that example to them, like say, Hey, listen, I've gone through some, some tough times, but I still have chosen to one, be grateful to go about my business in, in, in a respectful, loving way. Um, and to do it with a lot of class. Um, so I wouldn't know, bro, if like, if nobody would have found out if, you know, because the day that everybody found out what it was, I found out. So I actually found out like, yeah. 30 minutes before everybody found out, you know what I mean? So <laughs> if nobody found out, I wouldn't have found out, you know? So it kind of would have been just like one of those sad moments where we mourned the death of two people. Um, like I mourned the death of two people that I loved at that time, you know I mean? Obviously my, I love my grandmother forever. So um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. That's, that's actually a really good question. Um, I definitely I wonder, would think that my that my, my life would be different than it is now. That's what for I was sure. going to say. Like how? If, if this never breaks. Yeah. You're just believing I had this girlfriend in college. She mm -hmm. died. It's really sad. Now you're married. You've got kids. Your yep. life moves on. Yeah. Like, do you think your career in football is materially different if that doesn't break? Uh, for sure. And the reason why I say that is because what happened to me uh, what my life was like and what my reality was like after 
uh, the whole, sorry, after the whole catfishing thing came up, that's what created me. That's what created this was the scrutiny, was the hate, was the jokes, was the, was the memes, was um, the new narrative um, that now was when just a few days before that, it was Summit Manti. It was this guy plays football at such a high level, but his character is at a even higher level. And for some people, they just couldn't wrap their heads around the fact like, how can somebody be that good at football, but be such a good human? Yeah. You know what I mean? And so that's what Perfect. Ma- put me yeah. up there. Yeah. Um, and so when the narrative shifted and the narrative now became, man, that guy's an idiot. Like what a, what a fool. And then the memes came out, then Halloween came on, everybody started dressing up and I, and I would get tagged in all the jokes and then all the news outlets started joking about it. You know, like that rocked me to my core, like to the, the foundation of who I am. It tested that, you know, like my life for the next three years was, it was a wreck because I didn't understand at that time how heavily I had depended on people's opinions of me because it was all positive and it, let, it, it helped me to continue to do what I was doing. But I was feeding off of it and I didn't know until somebody came along and just kicked that kickstand out and that I just went f- face flat. And I'm like, okay, well, who am I? And I literally, bro, had to build myself up from square one brick one i had to lay it brick by brick and in a long-winded answer if if people didn't find out if i didn't find out i wouldn't be who i am today i wouldn't be immovable i wouldn't be an oak i wouldn't be somebody who walks around day to day grateful for the fact that I can walk around, be comfortable, because there were those days where I didn't want to go out in public. There was those days where every time I went down the aisle in the grocery store, somebody was saying something, you know, and it wasn't positive. You know, there were days where I asked, somebody would ask me for a picture and they would make fun of me. You know what I mean? Like those moments of having somebody tell you who you are, those moments of somebody telling you that you're a fool, those moments were the moments where I had to come to grips with myself and like, bro, like you got a million, millions of people telling you that you're this, who are you? You need to figure that out for yourself because the more you let people tell you who you are and the more you let you more, you start to believe them, the more that your, your foundation, this, this existence is going, it's, it's going to be a living hell. And so I had to, I literally had to crawl myself out of that hell hole. And that's what created this. I was I was actually expecting the opposite answer. I yeah. thought you were going to say if this didn't break, it would have helped me. It would have helped my career. Would have helped, but it would have helped the career, but not but not the person who you are. And the person. person to me is way more important than the career. Well said. That way more important. You know, like I I I am more than confident, bro, because of the the kid who I knew played that senior at Notre Dame with that confidence that he had at Notre Dame. There's no way that I wouldn't one still be playing right now. Two wouldn't had two big paychecks right now. Three, I definitely wouldn't be sitting here with you because I probably would have a big house in Hawaii or in California somewhere, <laughs> right? Like, yeah, there's there's just no way because who I was on the football field as an athlete, as a linebacker, as a foot bro, you couldn't touch me on the football field. It didn't matter who you were. You know, so as a football player, do I think that my career would have been different? A hundred percent. Why? Because I knew the confidence in which I played with when I was at Notre Dame. And more importantly, I knew the the lack of confidence I played with when I first got into the NFL. And my play my play in the NFL reflected I was garbage my first three years. Like garbaggio, bro. It was it was a scramble for me just to like make a play. Like it was like Voices screaming in my head every play, like, bro, are you sure what you're doing? Like, don't let him juke you out. Like, 
Are you sure this is the right tackle? Are you sure this is the right angle? Like, are you sure you're you're, you're not too high? Are you sure? Like, don't, don't, don't. And then right when I'm about to hit somebody, locked. It's frozen. Just, bro, I missed so many tackles my rookie year and my second year. Compared to that kid at Notre Dame, he's running through fools. You know, like, there's <laughs> no, there's, there is nothing. You know what I mean? There, there's, yeah. the confidence is, is at an all-time high. And I, I honestly believe, like, anybody who, in, wants to do anything great in this life whatever you choose to do you have to number one have confidence that you're the best at what you do and that kid at notre dame had that the the kid for the first three years at san diego and san diego chargers total 180 bro and my play my play reflected that but i wouldn't be the person i wouldn't be the man i wouldn't be the father i wouldn't be the husband and that for me is way more important than what could have been. Amen. Well said. There's a lot that we can build on mm-hmm. with what you just said. <laughs> oh my goodness. Um, I want to circle back to something that you said, which is, you know, you hit rock bottom yeah. when that news leaked. In your career, football-wise, where were you during that time? I was heading into, um, I was preparing for the combine. Okay. So this is between uh, Notre Dame and going to the NFL, yeah. getting ready for the combine. Yeah. Between, from from January, um, from January on, really. January 2013 on. It's interesting that you said that was rock bottom because in your career, you still had a lot going for you. Mm -hmm. It was inevitable you were going to go to the league. It was inevitable you were going to get drafted high, right? Mm -hmm. But for you, that wasn't that important. All of that didn't matter at this point, right? Because you as the person had hit the Mm -hmm. floor. Mm -hmm. You were all the way down. And then you just described, hey, Tyler, I'm better off as a man because it leaked, mm-hmm. I would have been better off as a football player if it didn't, but I'm better off as a man today. Yeah. So it's clear that from that time, your priorities were pretty straight. Like mm-hmm. you weren't, it's like you were always prioritizing Manti over yeah. sports mm-hmm. and the league. I think most people miss that. Yeah, I think most people have it backwards. So what do you, how do you encourage people to find that like like truly you've got to you've got to have a high level of self-love and yeah. care before you can then go and perform in whatever profession you're going to do yeah well the the thing about the summit is it teaches you a lot right it, it teaches you and it not only does it teach you a lot but it teaches you because it exposes you to a lot it exposes you to a lot of the the what the world calls as the finer things in life you get to you get to be you're held at such regard that you 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 stay at the, the the finest places at the nicest hotels you 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 get to ride in private jets you know all the monetary things that this world can give you it's when you reach that summit it's at your disposal you got what you want yeah yeah you have every day it's a buffet right the the greatest thing about being a member of the church and when i say this I'm going to take it a step further as the greatest thing about having a spiritual background, um, a spiritual foundation that was that that was built, um, starting with my parents, you know, being born and raised in the church, um, being growing up in La Ia, which is predominantly all members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter Day Saints. One one of the one one of the biggest advantages of that is you get to experience what peace feels like all of these things when you're at the summit the jewelry the 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 clothes the 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 clubs the hotels the private jets the rolls royces i've been in all of them all of them are cool all of them may give you may may give you a little excitement for the time being right but they're all missing something 
And it's the peace that can only come from God. That is a thing that I, that I recognized while I was up there at the summit that it's all missing something there. That's why people keep chasing at it. It's like, here's, here's some money. Well, I need more. Here's, here's more. I, I need some more. Here's this nice house. Well, I need a bigger one. It's the hit. Yeah. It's, it's that, it's that, that constant craving for it. Right. When God gives you peace, uh, uh-uh. it's just like, I just want to be around it. I just want to feel it constantly. It's not like, it's not like those, those, those worldly cravings. It's, you know, it's like how he, how he says, you know, drink from this and you'll never go thirsty again. That's, that is peace. When you start drinking from the fountain of the world, it's always gonna, you're always gonna be thirsty. Mm. And that is something that I am very, very grateful that I was given that foundation to know where to turn to when I wanna feel whole, when I wanna feel at peace with my life and with myself. And so with all of that being said, that is something for, for people who are in search of things, right? They're in search of a purpose. They're in search of, of, of trying to change their financial circumstances for them and their family. And that is all great. But I know a lot of people that are living in a billion dollar mansion that are miserable. And there are people that live in a hut that are happy as a clam that are surrounded by their kids and their kids know they love them and they love their kids and they wouldn't trade it for the other. So I would rather be in the mansion with my kids, happy as a clam. They know I love them. I know they love me. However, I would take that scenario and put it in anything. Understand that that's my core is, is, is having God at the center of my family having my kids, having my wife, having my siblings, everybody right with me than to live a life of lavish and be miserable but, and be alone, be by myself and not have my kids and my kids not know that I love them and me not have a relationship with my kids because that is where for me, that's the true meaning of life and that's the true um, source. That's the source at which I go to for my purpose, my passion, hence why I went on this journey of, of, I would call it like self redefining myself of who I am, my, my outer look. It wasn't for anybody. It wasn't for me. It's because when, as my kids grow up, I want them to see the example of the type of life I want for them is in the way that I live my life. Cause my kids aren't going to remember what I tell them, but they're going to remember how they saw me move. And how I walk through this life and how I do and how I do life, I want that to be a bigger lesson to them than what I say out of my mouth. When you go through experiences like this, the people around you tend to show themselves. Oh yeah, for sure. I yeah. wanna I don't wanna focus on the negative parts of this because yeah. there was a lot of people that probably showed themselves in a negative way. Yeah left your life, talk mm-hmm. their shit, whatever, whatever it was, mm-hmm. but they, they didn't have your back. Yeah. Who's one person that was your ride or die through all of this was just there was, was a rock through this whole situation. Um, there are seven of them. Brian Teo, Otilia Teo, Brianne Teo, Tiara Teo, Eden Teo, Maya Teo, Manasa. Those seem to all have the same last name. We all, mom, dad, my siblings. And again, bro, the summit will expose you to something. The summit will expose you to the entourage. The fall will reveal. <laughs> They will make that fall will make things very, very clear. And that's the beauty of it, yeah. of the fall, as it makes life crystal clear. Like at, at first, your 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 the water's a little murky. And then when you fall from from grace like that, it clears. <laughs> it makes things crystal clear. And uh, pre-2013, there was a there's a lot of people on my entourage. There was a lot of people saying, 
you're the greatest, you're the best, you're my inspiration, you're my I role model, you, you're my guy. I got you, like yeah. whatever you need, like I got your back. Oh, well, post 2013, where you at? But the only ones that were always there was, you know, somebody asked me this, asked me a similar question, and I told him this. You click on that Katie Kirk show that I was on post-2013. Who's the only two people you see there? My parents. The only two, bro. Nobody from the Heisman was there. Nobody from 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 all of the wars that I was there. No that I won that was there. Coaches, teammates. Coaches, nobody. teammates. Yeah. Nobody, nobody was was actively there. Now whether they were they were trying to, I don't know. But the only two you click on that show, the only two people that you see there with me, with our backs against the wall, was my parents. And like I said, crystal. That crystal clear, bro. And that's and that was what I was grateful for. That is what I meant by I wouldn't be who the man if I didn't do the fall. Because if you if I would have continued on that path, that that entourage would have doubled then tripled. And there's no way that somebody who's around that many people who's hearing those many things, whether it be positive or negative, can sit in front of you as a wholesome human being and say those things. Like there's a reason why those people that are at that level, they're so, I do not envy those people because I know the torment that is that life, that that life brings to have those many yeah. voices in your head. Me? <laughs> Crystal. So, yeah. Through that process, did you ever turn your back on God? Yeah. Talk to me about the evolution of your <clears throat> relationship with God. Well, two days after, two days after the news broke, I remember sitting, keep in mind, I'm in Florida. I'm in Bradenton, Florida. I'm at the IMG Academy. I'm, I'm trying to prepare for the combine. Um, news breaks, world, world is in chaos. Like, every, it's just consuming me, right? And so I remember I'm in my apartment. I'm in the bedroom portion of my apartment and I'm sitting I'm sitting at one ed edge of my bed looking across the other edge like I'm looking at you right now and yelling as if God was sitting on the other side yelling at him like how could you ever let this happen to me I did everything you ever wanted me to do I lived my life the way you wanted me to live it how could you let me fall man I've I've honored you and I've given you all the praise Every step of the way. And you let me, you let this happen to me. Like yelling, bro. As if the man himself was there. And I remember as I'm in this rage and as I'm yelling, um, the words footprints in the sand came up in my head. And I remember thinking at that time, like the only, the only thing that I know of those words were the song. It was a song by Leona Lewis at that time that was out that I would listen to. But I went on my phone and I, I, I typed it in and um, a poem pops up. And I don't know if you know about the poem Footprints in the Sand, but for those who don't know about that poem, it's about a, uh, it's about a man who passes. And as he, when he passes to the next life, he's standing with God and across the sky flashes scenes from his life. And he's standing with God and God says, he looks at God, he says, Hey God, I noticed that, you know, throughout my life, there's always two set of footprints, but the toughest times in my life, I only see one. How come in those toughest times of my life and the darkest times of my life, you left me, you abandoned me. And keep in mind, bro, I'm in this room by myself. It's dark. And I just, I just was yelling at this man as if he was sitting there. And the end of that poem, God says, my child. I would never leave you. Those times that you saw one set of footprints, that's when I carried you. And it was as if God himself just responded to my yelling. And then I opened the scriptures, bro. And then I think it's DNC 122 or 121, one of those chapters. Doctrine and Covenants, for those people who 
who don't know what I'm t- referring to, Doctrine and Covenants 121 or 122. And I, and, and I, I believe the backstory of it, and it just, it just so happened, they referenced it in General Conference this past weekend, was about Joseph Smith when he was in jail. And it talks about God's response to him and saying things that, you know, when, when hell shall open its mouth wide after you, if, if, if the heaven itself shall, shall come upon you, just all of these bad things that could help it, happen to an individual. At the, at, the, at the ending verses of that chapter, it says, Know thou, my son, that all of these things shall give you experience. The Son of Man hath descended below them all. Art are thou greater than he? Bro, I remember, bro, I'm just like sitting there like, okay, I get it. I get it. I'm not going to be perfect with it, but I understand. Now I need you to help me. And I need you to help me make sense of this life. So did I, did I turn my, my back on God? Yep. Did, did I go from that bedroom and perfectly follow him? Nope. There were those times where I was like, okay, God, like, come on now. Fourth year in the NFL, just starting to get my groove. No longer di- dealing with the anxiety. It's my contract year, right? First game, Kansas City Chiefs, 10 plus tackles. Ooh, this is feeling good. Prior to that year, my defensive coordinator put me on the side with our head coach said, hey, listen, you played 16 games. I'm the captain of the team. You play 16, 16 games, we'll pay you. You won't, your parents won't have to work another day in their life. We'll set you up for life as a, as a charger. Perfect. Boom. It's right there. It's attainable. I can reach it. I can taste it. I can feel it. That's what I got to do. Okay. I prepared myself that year. First game, like I said, Kansas City Chiefs, 10 plus tackles. We lose that game, unfortunately. Second game, Jacksonville Jaguars, 10 plus tackles again. Boom. I'm like, Ooh, this is feeling good. Third game, we're in Indianapolis playing the Colts. I already had six, six tackle, four, four or six tackles, bro. Beginning of the second quarter, four, like four or six already. Do the math. You're jamming. I'm jamming. Times that by four. That's, do the math. You know what I'm saying? That's 20 plus. (laughs) It's just feeling good. Beginning of the second quarter, I plant my left foot, Achilles. Boom, gone. Career, done. Possibly, done. Season for sure, done. All right, God. Come on now. We're back here. What's up, man? (laughs) But guess what, bro? My sister comes, she flies up from Hawaii to San Diego. The, the day that I get home, later on that day, she, she, she's in my house. She prepare, she's preparing for her mission. I had never read the Book of Mormon my whole life. First time ever with her. My wife, we, we dated, when she was my girlfriend at the time, we dated for years. She took the missionary lessons, still wasn't a member through that experience with my sister and being around my sister, she joined the church. Months later, I, I took all my endowment. Okay, God, I get it. I understand. I don't, I don't, I wish that it was the other way, but I wouldn't be the man. I wouldn't be endowed. I wouldn't be married. I wouldn't be sealed in the temple. I get it. What is important to you? The football or the man? Man, I want to talk about this tattoo <laughs> and the Polynesian culture. For those who can't see, Manta's got a full sleeve. Does that wrap to your chest too? No, just right here. Cuts got, off a, the got a full sleeve. Yeah. It's a Polynesian tribal tattoo. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> talk to me about what this tattoo represents, and talk to me about what the Polynesian culture means to you yeah so i first got the first part of my tattoo done um my freshman year in college and um you know it was it was a big deal um it, you know for me and and for my family um my, my dad is very old school um and for those who are old school understand what that means you know there, there there's 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 a progression there's there's a hierarchy right like i as as a polynesian Young man, I can't just, you can't just go do something, you know, because you, 
all your actions reflect not only yourself, it also reflects your family. So I can't just go out and get a tattoo, you know, yeah. like that's just, that's not possible. So for me to be able to get a tattoo, my freshman year, I asked my dad and my dad was, was gracious to let me get one, but he made sure that I understood what, what that would mean, you know, especially for a member of the church allowed me to get it. And so a lot of the motifs and the designs of this one has, has designs that represent my father, represents my family, um, represents qualities about myself, um, strength, um, wisdom. Um, and then the bottom part, um, I just got like a year ago, um, from Fred Frost out here in, 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 in Utah, one of the best. Um, and I went to Fred specifically because I didn't want, I didn't want it to look like two different tattoos because this was done by a different artist. And so I wanted to make sure that he was able to carry out the same designs, the same things that were important to me on this one. And so I was grateful that he was able to do that. But the Polynesian culture, it is a culture that is built on God. It is a culture that is built on family. It's a culture that's built on respect. It's a culture that's built on 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 humility, on hard work, on strength, on being um, very aware of others. And that I think that's, I didn't realize how, how big that was until now I get into society now and it's so about me, about me, 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 me. In, in the culture that I grew up in, it's about how can I help you? And that is what has built me um to be who i am now it's got me in it's got me in some trouble right a lot of the reasons why i mean i got into that situation was because i was trying to help 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 um but i'd rather be the one that's willing to help than the one that's scared because of the the repercussions um so um my culture is very very important to me it's something that i'm very very grateful that i was raised in um and um it's something it's 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 a part of my life, a big part of my life that governs a lot of the choices that I make. Polynesian culture is near and dear to my heart. Adopted a brother in high school who's didn't have a dad. Mom passed away. Mm -hmm. He played running back. I played quarterback. We were just that dynamic duo, <laughs> yeah. you know, and it was Willie Wolf Graham. And um, a few funny quirks about the Polynesian culture. For sure. Like one of them that I always bring up is Polynesians are like the hardest working lazy people ever. <laughs> like, do you agree with that? Well, it depends, you know, like <laughs> I, I would like to say there's a, there, there's, there comes a time where you've paid your dues, you know, and now it's somebody, it's somebody else's turn <laughs> to pay the dues, you know, it's, now it's my son's turn to mow the grass, you know. <laughs> it's my daughter's turn to wash the dishes. But we know exactly how the the uh, the grass should be mowed. We know exactly how the house should look when it's clean white because we cleaned it for so many years. So, <laughs> well, yeah, we we're very very hardworking. But I like to think that at a certain time we get we get smart, and we're like, okay, I don't got to do it anymore. So you got to do it, you know. So um, I see I see what I see what that means, bro. There was a group of us that used to drink kava together back in the day. Mm. <laughs> and we would, we would sit around with these little chairs. We put a Home Depot bucket in the middle. We'd, we'd you know, one of the OGs would make the kava. Mm -hmm. And we, <laughs> this one week, it was basically all, all Polynesians and me every, mm -hmm. every week. And uh, one week I invited another friend who was a white guy. Yeah. And How did that go? He came and he drank a couple of drinks yeah. and he started throwing up. Yeah, yeah. And everybody was clowning him the rest yeah. of the night and he, he was all sick and like, yeah. I got to go home. And so can you share, you know, th those were some good experiences sitting around drinking kava. Mm -hmm. And there's also other experiences doing, doing you know, cookouts. Cooked mm -hmm. a lot of pigs, cooked a lot. Yep. I've cooked a buffalo, a full buffalo in the oh, ground wow. before. Yeah. We've done a lot of stuff like that. So, you know, culturally around things like, you know, kava, barbecuing, that mm -hmm. sort of thing. Talk mm -hmm. to me about that. Well, we, we call them kongais, right? It's, 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 it means potluck. And um, growing up, like that was, those were the, 
those were some of my best memories. Yeah. And a lot, and that, that, that is, has, has to be one of the biggest reasons why me and my wife moved to Utah. Um, when my parents moved out here six years ago, my, my siblings followed them. Um, and when we lived in San Diego, I looked at my wife and I said, listen, I don't want my kids growing up without their grandparents, without their cousins. Um, I had cousins who did that. Yeah. And when they would come to Hawaii, we're like, you guys are, you guys are a little different, you know, like, <laughs> like there's something a little different about you, you know? And so I didn't want my, they're looking at the tarot. We're like, what is Yeah. That? <laughs> like th there's just certain things like when, when certain things, right. So when mom stands up or dad stands up to you, you better beat them to do whatever they're trying to do. Like yeah. whether they're trying to take their plates or you see mom, dad are done with their eating. You get up and you go, Hey mom, let me, mom, yeah. dad, let me take this. Right. So there are certain things that culturally were raised around that when there were family members that weren't raised around it, they just wouldn't get it. And for those of us who know, it's like, bro, doing? like, what are you doing? You know what I mean? <laughs> like, so I didn't want that to be the reality for my kids. Um, I know what I know, but it's, it takes a village to raise a child. And I wanted my children to be raised in a certain village. And uh, that village just happened to live here in Utah. So talking about potlucks, talking about just being around family. Again, like the Polynesian culture is built around that. Right? It's not built around the individual. It's built around what the individual can do for the individual's family. Um, and one of the best ways to do that is around family atmosphere whether that be in a kava circle whether that be you know barbecuing whether that be doing chores whether that be doing public you know like some some service a service project somewhere everything is done together everything is done in a family unit and you get to see the strength of being in a unit and then the strength you now have alone it's not the same so i'd rather be with the unit you know, and so um, that was such, some, something that's so beautiful. And what was so beautiful about your story is you notice how when you brought your friend, like it just welcoming. 100%. That is, that is the culture. Yeah. We don't see color. Yeah. We see energy. We see vibe. If you, if you vibing, bro, if you're cool, Come you're on, in. yeah. You're, you're one in. of the homies. You're one of those souls. You're one of the tokos. You know what I mean? Like yeah. you're one of the boys. Yeah. Like we, we, you. Once you come out the car and you a certain, certain uh, race, we don't be like, oh, bro. You know what I mean? Like, nah. Like we don't, we don't, we don't roll that way. It was like, one, you're verified, so you know that what we stand for, yeah. and we know that you wouldn't bring anybody into the circle, yeah. That didn't stand for the same yeah, things. Well said. You well know what said. I mean? So that's, that's the culture. Yeah. I think there's a lot that, I mean, all cultures are unique and different and have their, their beautiful things and mm -hmm. their downsides and stuff. Yeah. But I, I, I truly think that the Polynesian culture is a culture that a lot of other cultures can learn from. Mm -hmm. I want to talk a bit about football and then we'll wrap up with uh, talking about what's next for you. But you know, I wanted to ask you the question. Um, you dealt with some injuries. Obviously, you talked about the Achilles one, which was mm -hmm. really the the big one for you, right? Yeah. How do you how do you liken injuries in football to setbacks in life? Um, injuries and setbacks are similar because it allows you to have a greater sense and a greater understanding of who you are with every injury that i've had i've had to know my body know functions on my body knowing how to get my body back to its peak form and how to do that the fastest way now some of them take some time so you're going to have to have some grace there you're going to have to learn that some things take time, like things don't heal overnight. The Achilles yeah. doesn't heal in 24 hours. Yeah. It heals in 12 months. So having that faith of trusting the process, delayed gratification, just answering the bell every single day is the same approach to adversities in life. When adversities hit, 
sometimes it's not it's not going to get better in 24 hours sometimes it's going to take a year in my in my case it took three years for me to start feeling myself it took 10 years for the world to start to see like the truth so there comes a, there's a sense of of self awareness that is created with injuries and there's a there's a level of self awareness that is created when adversity hits when adversity hits you get you have a choice you have a choice to either let it consume you and be the victim or you have the choice to grab it by the horns control what you can control and make the best out of that situation because you'll start to learn as you have adversities that adversities and I like to call it adversities is God's way of adding more weight to the bar it's his way of making you stronger mm. it's his way of saying okay listen you can do that now do this and now just like as if I were to add more weight to the bar in the gym I may only be able to lift it once maybe I won't even be able to lift it but God knows and he believes that I'm capable and he's my spotter. So even if I start to heal, he'll be there. Mm -hmm. It may not feel that way sometimes, but he'll be right there walking with you, right there spotting you. And so that is what I think and I feel and I believe the similarities are between my physical injuries and the adversities that happen in my life is just giving me a better awareness of who I am and what I need to do to become the best version of me, whether it be physically, spiritually, emotionally, mentally, whatever it is. That's a beautiful analogy. I think you should write a poem <laughs> like footprints in the sand and call yep. it like barbells on the <laughs> weight bench. Or yeah, 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 yeah. I love that. Was there any, was it, was, was there any experience in the NFL walking out onto a field that was as magical or surreal as walking out at Notre Dame. Or was Notre Dame really the, the peak? When in football terms, Notre Dame was the peak. Yeah. Like there, I, I the energy, the atmosphere, yes, the whole I, deal. I, I didn't, <laughs> I didn't attain that level in the NFL um, from, from a football standpoint, from, from um, the, from the world's perspective, I didn't. The all eyes on the you. All thing. eyes on you. Yeah. The belief, the yeah. Manti got this. Yeah. Like, don't worry. We have Manti on the team. And when you walk he's, out with the flag, gonna, it's like. Yeah. He's going to take that. Yeah. That was Notre Dame. Notre Dame was. Everything's okay because five is out there. Yeah, you had you know the I mean? whole stadium on your back. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. and and you know a lot of it had to do with me, but a lot of it had to do with my teammates too, and the the the, the camaraderie, the unit, which we were able yeah. to build. Yeah, right. Because let's let's face it, football, football is a team, the, one of the greatest team sports, if not the yeah. greatest. There's eleven eleven dudes out there, eleven different alphas. And it takes a special individual or a group of special individuals to take 11 alphas and bring them together. Yeah. And I was able to be one of those, not the only, but one of those that was able to connect with each and every one of them in a way that when the, the leader spoke, they not only listened, but they believed. There's a difference. Yeah. Like there's one thing to listen, but there's another thing to believe that Whatever I'm saying as a leader is what we're gonna do, and that 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 takes a lot of love, man. You know, not only love on my part, but love on their part, and to know each other on the level that, hey, bro, no matter what happens, I'm riding with you. So, you know, I I the Notre Dame days, bro, it it was something. No, you know, what does that feel like? I mean, walking walking out of the tunnel, Notre Dame, maybe the most iconic college mm -hmm. football program in history. Mm -hmm. Is it possible to describe what that feels like? You know when, um, you know in that movie Gladiator, where Maximus takes his helmet off and the Emperor tells him to take his helmet off, and everybody starts to realize who he is. He doesn't have to say who he is, even though he says, "I'm Maximus Decimus Meridius." 
yeah. commander of the legions. And like, but everybody in that Colosseum and the people that he was fighting with, the gladiators that he was fighting with, understood immediately who that man was. And immediately after they understood what happens after, everybody starts to make sure that the general is okay. That's what that feels like in that stadium. So what does that feel like? It's like, yeah, oh my God. It, it's, it's the most, it is the most alpha, most, you, you really feel unbeatable. Like there was nothing, there's, there's nothing the opponent, the game is over before it even starts. When they walk out, you know. They know. When they know I walk out, out. Yeah. when when I walk, it's it's like I saw this with this this thing with with when they said with Ray Lewis how Ray Lewis used to walk up and down the sidelines before the game, or when he would come out of the tunnel, the whole the the other team would watch. That's what that's like. Is it's like a lion roaming, and all the other a animals watch, and they have to. Okay, let's let him be. And we'll stay here. Like, that's what that feeling feels like. Like, the ultimate alpha male. It's crazy, bro. <laughs> <laughs> well, when I walked into the gym today. It was kind of like that. The huh? first person I saw <laughs> over on the side, I was like, who's that gorilla? <laughs> that, that silver back over there. Yeah, yeah. That's, and then I chest like, bumped you, and then you knew what was up, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um. You still think about football a lot? Yeah, I do. You still think you got it? No, I definitely don't. <laughs> Bro, looking I, at you, I beg to differ. I mean, you're, you're mentally, in crazy yes. shape. Mentally, yes. This physical, it's a different type. Yeah. You know, like I'm... You just my, have your, your yeah. aches and pains. Yeah. Are, my uncle my uncle said it best. I look better than I... Like physically, yeah, yeah. aesthetically, yeah. I look better than I did. But you when don't I, feel better yet. But I don't feel better. I'm not able... Yeah. Not not just because of injuries, but the training that I'm doing. Like I'm not explosive. Yeah. You know, I'm not training to be tear, explosive. Tear a hamstring, you yeah. Run a yeah. Right now. Bro, I might just pull I I not <laughs> might I know for sure. If I ran on one kickoff, I'm pulling something, you know. Like <laughs> I know I know what I'm training for, bro, is not to play ball. <laughs> I love it, man. Well, you since I've known you, I've been really impressed with your mindset. And I think the audience today can can feel that and hear that. What's next for you? How are you going to parlay this really healthy mindset that yeah. you have right now into your next thing? Yeah. Well, you know, I've talked to you about it. Um, everything, everything that I that I am doing and will do um, is rooted in one one belief. And that is, I want everything that is great in this world for my kids and for my wife. Everything that is great, but that has to start with me. And when the new year hit, I realized that the shape that I was in wasn't the type of shape that I could honestly sit in front of my kids and say, kids, do stuff that are hard. Kids, overcome this. Kids, finish what you start. Kids, life is going to be hard. You need to be strong. I wanted my kids to see me do what I wanted them to do. I wanted them to do hard stuff. I wanted them to be disciplined. I wanted them to understand that on the other side of discomfort is glory. On the other side of pain is, dis is glory. To embrace hard embrace um adversity i couldn't do that being a slob being lazy and so i started to make changes in my life um with my health and then i started to make changes up here and these are the most important ones and that's why um you know i talked to you about my 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 plans for the future um you know in business in 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 building building something um, that would change 
the circumstances of the Teo family for generations, not just me, not just my kids, but my kids' kids, their kids. Um, but changing it not only monetarily, but changing it up here and changing it in here because I didn't want to be, I can't remember who said it, but he said, my, my grandfather walked to work. His son drove, let's say, a truck. His son drove a Mercedes. His son will walk again. I didn't want that cycle. I didn't. And, and what happens is when you start to get to a certain level, you start to enable your kids. I'm not enabling my kids. And I don't want my kids to <laughs> enable them. I want them to see what it takes to do great things. I want them to see the accountability. I want them to see the discipline. I want them to see the sacrifice. I want them to see the hard work. And then them take what they see and implement it in their life into whatever their passion is. And as they start to do that, then their kids can see. And we just build this empire that for generations, our family will be set. Because I came up from, from hard times. My father came up from hard, harder times. My grandfather came up. So it's the progression of life and I want to make sure that the progression of my family goes up and if there's anybody that has a chance to do it it's going to be me and I'm going to take on that um I'm I'm that one that's going to change it I'm that one that can change that when that bill was passed around that same bill that was passed from generation to generation that on that bill had a price and if you paid that price that price by paying that price, you change the, the, the circumstances of your family fa your family forever. I'm the one that grabbed that bill and I said, I'm going to pay that thing. And I'm going to continue to pay it. But now I'm going to pay it at a, at a scale that nobody in my family ever thought was attainable. That nobody in my family ever thought was possible. But why not it be me? You know. So that, going to wrap everything up, that is, re that is the result of... Fo focusing more on the man than the football player. Because that football player wouldn't have had this had he not gone through the road that he went through by going through the fall. And it's the man that has been created that that's that's the soul that goes throughout this life. That's the soul that carry out, carries on throughout the eternities. And that's forever for me. Amen. Thank you, brother. Thank you, brother. For being on. This was a, this was a pleasure. <laughs> Thank you, bro. Yeah. Good times.